Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the hopefully last uh, Cradle to Cradle Cafe in this webinar style. Um, the cafe is actually about meeting people and um, in real life, and that's, uh, that's where it's all about. Uh, fortunately, it's, it doesn't work uh, at this moment um, with an audience. Um, first of all, uh, welcome, uh, a warm welcome. It's the most warm welcome uh, today. Uh, we have uh, our, our speakers, uh, Marco de Brummelstroet, uh, Ton van Hoeven and Arne Leibers. In a few minutes, I will introduce them uh, 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 better. Um, and of course, a warm welcome to all our uh, speakers and all our viewers uh, via the webcast. And um, um, yeah, I hope it's gonna be a, a vibrant and interesting uh, uh, session. Uh, after each uh, speaker, you can, um, yeah, we, we have some time for one or two burning questions. Our uh, web uh, uh, host, Mark Janssen, will, uh, uh, yeah, answer them or will... Um, help you, you, you will help me, okay. <coughs> and we are here in uh, the beautiful St. Olaf's Chapel, uh, part of the NH Barbizon Palace uh, in the center of Amsterdam, where Baatsemans uh, Audiovisual uh, built up this uh, studio. My name is Peter Derksen and I'm working for Taket, one of the four organizing companies. Um, then we have partner Moza. On behalf of Moza, uh, Joanne Schuitemaker is in the studio and Mark Janssen is um, operating the chat box. Um, the four, uh, the, the, um, yeah, then we have partner Arendt. Uh, Carlijn Jonkers is a contact uh, for Arendt and the fourth and, uh, partner is Cubic. And Marianne van Sander is um, not here. She is uh, at home, she's ill. Um, all the best, Marianne. Um, well, we are organizing these cafes since 2009, um, and this is the uh, 61st um, um, uh, version of the Cradle to Cradle Cafe. Uh, all the companies uh, are uh, producing and selling their products uh, following the Cradle to Cradle principles. But now, back to the Cradle to Cradle Cafe, Urban Mobility. Our first speaker is Marco de Brummelstroet, a professor in uh, mobility futures, uh, in urban mobility futures, uh, at the University of Amsterdam, also called the cycling professor. Um, the first 80 viewers will get this e-book. This is a real book, but you get the e-book of The Right of the Fastest, a book written by uh, Marco. The second speaker is Ton Venhoeven, um, founder, principal architect and urban planner of Van Hoeven CS, an Amsterdam-based uh, uh, architectural firm with more than 60 professionals. And the third speaker is uh, Arne Leibers of Meccano Architects from Delft. And Arne works on a wide range of projects from urban planning to uh, interior design for the train of the future or tomorrow, as we say in, in Dutch. Um, well, after each presentation, um, the speaker answers uh, one or two, or the speaker can, can, uh, can uh, answer one or two burning questions and ask in the chat, uh, and uh, Mark is ready uh, for, the, for receiving your questions. Um, after the, the last presentation, our guests will have a discussion with each other, um, fed by additional questions from the chat. So I... Um, yeah, I wish you all a very pleasant uh, session today, and I want to um, invite Marco to start his presentation. Well, thank you very much. Language is not a mirror of reality, but language profoundly shapes what we see, what we don't see, and how we shape our own reality. This means that if we think that we really want to radically change our thinking about urban mobility, we need to deep dive to the narratives that inform our ideas. And I will tell you a story that will help us understand that. This is in my neighborhood, uh, in the city of Ede, in the middle of the Netherlands. Uh, and this is a building that is uh, smack in the middle of a newly developed uh, urban uh, development with a lot of young families. This was the old canteen building of a factory, a huge factory of 4,000 employees that went here to eat their sandwiches during lunch. 
but no longer today, of course. The factory doesn't exist any longer, and there are a lot of houses uh, around this. So this, um, this uh, beautiful building is being uh, repurposed as, a, as an elementary school. And that elementary school was presented to the neighborhood with the following, uh, the following plan for the outside environment. And this plan shows us something peculiar about the language we use to think about our reality. So what we see here is on the right side of the, of, the, of the plan, we see the school building, the canteen building, which is the gray area. And the black triangle is the place where children will enter and exit the school building. I want you to focus on the, the yellow part of this uh, plan. This is the schoolyard. And the schoolyard, as you can see here, has 755 square meters of, of play space. In this school, according to the plans, 250 children will go there every day. So if you do a rough calculation, you will quickly realize that each child, on average, has three square meters to play outside. And this plan was presented as the outcome of a very long process where all kinds of experts discussed and put the puzzle together. So this plan was presented to the neighborhood as it fits all the norms. And indeed, if you look into it, there is indeed a norm in the Netherlands for play space for children outside of their school, which is, you guessed it, exactly three square meters. But then, if you start uh, thinking about it uh, and putting that in perspective, you see some peculiar things. Uh, so one thing that I did is I looked into the norms for our livestock in the Netherlands. And we have a norm specifically uh, for, for chicken, free-range chicken. So if you buy eggs from a free-range chicken in the Netherlands, it means that this chicken has to have at least four square meters of sp outside space. Otherwise, they cannot be called a free-range chicken. They are called an industrial chicken. So this raises the question, why do we offer our children one square meter less than we offer our free-range chicken? So where does this industrial child norm come from? This has everything to do with language. As I said, language is not a mirror of reality. The language we use makes us perceive certain things, makes us see some things, and obscures others. And by doing that, language um, shapes our reality. It shapes things that we tend to see as problems and tend to see as solutions. So let's go a bit deeper into how this works. We need language to simplify reality. That's the first step here. Uh, the first characteristic of language is, is a necessary simplification because without such a simplification, we could not even discuss something today. So language is a, is a necessary simplification of reality. But in simplifying, you by definition make choices. And these choices are also by definition arbitrary. All the choices we make in simplifying uh, the reality into, uh, uh, into the language we use, all these choices can be discussed and they can be debated. And this is so important, especially in the field of mobility, uh, for a third characteristic of language. And the third characteristic of language is that language is performative. As Donella Meadows already taught us, the, the simplification we make and the choices we make in that simplification shape reality. And the best example to understand this comes from a book by James Scott, Seeing Like a State. And he uses the forest to explain how this works. If you want to govern something, James Scott tells us, you have to simplify reality as well. You have to use indicators to govern it. And he uses the forest as an example. So we're looking here at an image of the primeval forest, a complex dynamic ecosystem with all kinds of feedback loops. And because of that, this forest offers, um, uh, offers a, a habitat for a wide diversity of flora and fauna. It serves multiple goals, because in this forest you can easily hide, you can easily hunt, you can easily build a nest, you can easily play, you can easily grow, and so on and so forth. But this radically changed at the end of the 18th century, because at that point in time, the forest became seen as a sort of a, a harvesting ground for wood. Wood became a very important building material, fuel, um, and uh, material uh, um, uh, in, in general. So to, to deal with that, uh, a completely new scientific domain was founded, scientific forestry. And the scientific foresters came with a concept to look at these forests in a way to understand the potential for wood production. This was called the Normalbaum in German, or the standard tree, or standardbaum, 
uh, in, in Dutch or English. And then, and then something started to happen. Large owners of forests started to use this concept to make their forest more and more efficient for wood production. And over time, and this took several decades, but over time, Europe came to, to see the forest on the right. So from the primeval forest, we moved to the production forest. And in the production forest, we basically are looking at two lines of standard trees. Everything else needed to go for the purpose of wood production. There are no bushes anymore. You cannot hide. You cannot hunt. You cannot build a nest. So as a result of this, all the goals of the forest that are served on the, on the left side are gone on the right side. So we see uh, a massive decrease of the amount of, of, uh, of bees, for instance, and, and birds in, this, uh, in these kinds of habitats. And perversely, and very interesting for us, I, the, the, the forest on the right is not even more effective in wood production because the simplification that was used also made us uh, lose uh, important dynamic feedback loops that made the forest robust. So the, the, this forest, the production forest, is very vulnerable for all kinds of uh, weather events and diseases. So why are we talking about forests? Because, as I would argue, the same process happened with our streets. This, you could say, is the primeval street. The street as the place or space between buildings. That was just a leftover in the city of, uh, uh, and that, was gr that has grown over my millennia. And also here you see all kinds of dynamic feedback loops, which makes this place, the space between buildings, serve different goals. Here in the 1920s in New York, you can see people using the streets to trade, to buy stuff, to sell stuff. You can see people meeting each other as a sort of a public living room. You can see people playing especially children, but also adults. And of course, you can also see people traveling through it. Um, but all of this happened in a dynamic uh, balance, you could say, that was formed over millennia. But just as in the forest, this radically changed. And the change happened in the 1920s, about 100 years ago, especially in the US, with the introduction of the, of the mass introduction, actually, of the, 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 the produced uh, motorized vehicle that we now would call a car. This was introduced to the street and resulted in huge pressure on all the other goals because not only the car itself, but especially the speed that it introduced, interfered, collided literally with all the other goals of the street. Children died. Massive, massive amounts of children died. And there was a huge discussion in the 1920s. Uh, and the discussion was actually framed in terms of justice. And in justice terms, this new innovation was completely unacceptable. We could not uh, have this on our streets while we were also using the streets for all these other goals. But Peter Norton, in the book Fighting Traffic, shows us that it took only 10 years to completely change the language of the street. In the 1930s, the language of the street was no longer a language of justice, but it became a language of control, efficiency, and freedom. It's the 1930s, USA, and traffic engineering was born. Traffic engineers didn't exist. They were invented. It was a new scientific discipline invented to come up with a new language for the street. And that's what we see today. 90 years later, we see how the ideas that traffic engineers came up with, the languages that they introduced to think about the street, solidified. If we look at this typical Dutch intersection, you can see how it solidified. At first, traffic engineers had a background in water engineering and started to see the streets as pipelines. Then they started to introduce physics and, uh, and concepts from physics, like a gravity model or seeing humans as biomechanical particles that are colliding with each other. Then they introduced concepts from economics and they started to see and simplify humans on that street as a homo economicus, rational, egoistic, self-maximizing individuals that would always be in conflict with each other. So streets, instead of places of justice, became places of throughput. And intersections became questions of conflict avoidance. Because every time an egoistic individual meets another egoistic individual, you have to introduce an external system, which is called the traffic light, to manage their, uh, their intrinsic uh, conflict. 
And as in the production forest, everything else needed to go, right? You can only have this working if all the children learn that they can no longer play on the streets. In the Netherlands, the street uh, play day was actually abolished by uh, the safety, uh, the traffic safety organizations because they said this, this is the wrong message to children. Children should learn that they can no longer play on the streets. They have their street or they have their playgrounds and they should, we should teach them already at the age of four how to behave in a way that they are not interfering with the throughput of traffic. People get zebra crossings. We invent jaywalking. We are no longer just allowed to cross the street and to use it for any other purpose than the throughput of traffic. So that brings us to the challenges we face today. We've seen COVID. We have seen how the streets are unlocked and how our imagination was actually hampered before. Many people have seen the radical monopoly, the fact that their imagination was also solidified because the solidification of this language happens through norms, through guidelines, through rules and laws, but also through institutions and ministries and aldermen of mobility and such and so forth. And in the end, it's solidified in asphalt, concrete, and finally in our imagination. So if we really now want to use this momentum to go towards radical rethinking of urban mobility, uh, of, of circular mobility, of sustainable mobility, we need to question the underlying language, the underlying rationality, as Robert Piersig tells us in his book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. If we do not do that, we simply risk to reproduce the factory all over again. Now, the beauty of linguistic diversity is that it reveals to us uh, just how ingenious and how flexible the human mind is. Human minds have invented not one cognitive universe, but 7,000, 7,000 languages spoken around the world. Uh, and we can create many more. Languages, of course, are living things, things that we can hone and uh, change to suit our needs. I've told you about how speakers of different languages think differently, but of course, that's not about how people elsewhere think. It's about how you think. It's how the language that you speak shapes the way that you think. Right? And that has, gives you the opportunity to ask, why do I think the way that I do? How could I think differently? And also, what thoughts do I wish to create? Wow, right? What thoughts do you wish to create? Talking about language and the importance and how it framed our thinking about reality of the last 90 years is not a depressing story. If you listen to Lera Boroditsky, and I really recommend you to watch her full TED talk on this, it's actually a very powerful tool because if there's one thing that we're good at as humans is to reinvent languages. But then we have to do that. We have to see and radically uh, uh, force ourselves to see our current languages and find radical alternatives. So let's go back to the industrial child norm. What happened here is that we gave our public space to the traffic engineer. The first expert on the table was a traffic engineer. And if you do that, if the street belongs to the traffic engineer, the first question that we ask ourselves is how do we get children safely through to school in a car dominated environment? And the best answer to that question, I strongly believe, is a kiss and ride. Because I made you look at the yellow part, but you have to look at the blue and the purple part. That is a kiss and ride. And a kiss and ride helps children to go to school safely in a car dominated environment. You can drop off your child close to the door and the car drivers do not have to turn around, which is much safer. But as a result of that answer, we are getting a public space that meets all norms, but doesn't meet any wish. 1,100 square meters are given away for the purpose of traffic engineering. But what if we change the question? What if the streets do not belong to traffic engineering, but streets belong to our children? Then the question becomes, what is the role of cars in the living environment of our children for the next 40 years? And when we ask that question, the best answer that came from the neighborhood, from the children, from the school director, and in the end from the traffic engineer was, cars do not have a role in the living environment of our children. And as a result, we could claim 1,100 extra square meters and the children can now play autonomously and free, safe and green in a much bigger part of their public space. So wrapping up, language, 
Language is not a mirror of reality. Language profoundly shapes what we see, what we do not see, and what realities we will shape. If we want to have radical change, we need to question where our ideas of mobility come from. We need to find alternatives. Is mobility only a quality or a quantity to reduce as a disutility or, uh, or a cost going from A to B? And are our streets mainly places where we want to go through as fast as possible? Or can we change that? And can we make them profoundly and meaningful places where society flourishes? That's our choice. That's your choice. And I wish you all the best. Thanks. Thank you, Marco, for your presentation. Mark, do we have some burning questions from the audience? Yes, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. Yes, uh, Marco, uh, one of the questions uh, that arise um, is what are the challenges um, to, uh, to get uh, public, uh, public areas, um, the bicycles uh, down, to, down to the ground? What are the challenges? You see that in some certain cities, but you see a lot of, uh, especially in Dutch cities, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, bikes uh, still parked on, uh, on the street. What are the challenges in order to get them uh, well, situated I, under the floor. I think this, this question shows us uh, how we are stuck in this radical monopoly of seeing the street as a place for traffic. And bikes are, just as cars, are devices for traffic. And they should maybe not dominate our streets. So what, I, what I'm uh, proposing and arguing you for is that we need to be, have a much more wider uh, radical political discussion of what our streets are for. Uh, and now we just accept that 60 or 70 percent of our public spaces are given away to traffic, be it cars or now we have e-scooters, we have bicycles. Uh, and we, we tend to forget that that's a question that we can ask ourselves. So in my neighborhood, where this school is, uh, is uh, situated, uh, more than five soccer fields, so it's 1,300 houses, and over five soccer fields large area is given away to parking. Zero of that, by the way, is for bike parking. And that's why the bikes are then parked on the sidewalks. Uh, so it's five soccer fields that we give away without even thinking about it, without even politicizing it, without even discussing it. You give it away to the parking of private, uh, private vehicles. And I think what I want to, to raise here is not that we need to shift that from cars to bikes, but that we need to radically rethink the narratives we use to think about our streets. Yeah, well, I think that answers the questions uh, right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, then I want to invite uh, Ton for giving his uh, presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, whoops. Yes, um, I would like to tell something about uh, the um, uh, projects we do. And uh, first, I want to start with um, uh, transit-oriented development as a principle. Um, in, um, in the past uh, decennia, this uh, concept uh, to organize cities uh, connected to public transport uh, has uh, become stronger and stronger. And uh, this um, a graph from the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, uh, where they uh, clearly show what is the um, what should be the hierarchy in um, in city design and uh, mobility uh, engineering. And the first principle is uh, walking, then cycling, uh, connecting, and then transit. And after that also uh, the car. But uh, what is important is the mix of functions. So you can walk from one place to the other, densify, so things are closer together, compact, so they're even uh, dense enough to make uh, public transport possible and shift from private car to public transport and walking. Um, this is already a uh, quite old project, but I just want to highlight uh, two aspects of it. Uh, this is a uh, competition design for, um, for Korea, for a city of 500,000 people. And here you can see that uh, in this uh, city design, we try to experiment <coughs> with uh, transit-oriented development, where we uh, create areas which are very dense, uh, ver and areas that are uh, totally car free, like the orange dotted lines indicate uh, a block um, and the block sizes all vary. They, and there are very many different uh, block sizes, uh, but these blocks are always car free areas. 
um, we call them micro cities. And the red areas, that's where uh, all the uh, traffic comes together. So in, uh, in this um, picture, in the plan, you can see all the different blocks. Uh, they have different dimensions, different densities. Uh, but where the, uh, the train and the metro and the, um, uh, and the urban highway come together, that's where you can find those high density areas uh, to connect to that uh, public transport and to make optimal use of the public transport. Each metro station um, can become a mobility hub, a mo multimodal uh, node which also serves the neighborhood. This is um, uh, the result of a study by TNO, how to improve urban logistics. We all know that uh, today with uh, um, internet uh, shopping that we have all these delivery services that uh, crisscross the city and um, actually cause a lot of traffic in the city. Uh, and there is a way to reduce that traffic by uh, strictly organizing, organizing the flows with uh, local hubs and regional hubs to create uh, much smaller traffic uh, near the home, like uh, even walking, uh, cycling, uh, those uh, modalities. This can be adapted uh, also in this old, in this old uh, design. Um, now I want to say something about uh, the larger uh, picture that uh, the challenges we're facing. Um, we did a study for the city of the future in 2018 and uh, there we looked at uh, all the challenges for this uh, century. So it's, um, we have a raw material crisis, uh, fresh water, emissions, biodiversity is going really downhill etc etc main issues are lots of biodiversity climate change depletion of raw materials and pollution um, here you can see the donut uh, economy uh, graph by kate rayworth and uh, here you can see that uh, all the red is actually not good so the climate change is uh, is out of control biodiversity loss is out of control land conversion is out of control we currently use like 80% of the Earth's uh, surface and that should uh, be reduced to 50%. Um, but also on a social level, uh, there are all kinds of uh, things which are absolutely not tolerable. Uh, so we have to, um, to deal with all those issues and we have to deal with them in these 10 years. The period from 2020 to 2030 is absolutely critical uh, to achieve the goals that we agreed on uh, for the year 2050. So that's about uh, the circular economy, about uh, climate change, etc. So we have to deal with everything at the same time. We cannot afford to first solve the CO2 crisis, then uh, move on to the biodiversity crisis. We have to do everything at once. Um, this is our location in Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam Alexander. Um, the, the location is six meters below current sea level with a sea level rise of maybe one meter, but uh, in other scenarios could be even four meters. This is really uh, a very big issue that we have to solve. Biodiversity crisis, deteriorating ecosystems, new metro line, which gives opportunities. Uh, so these are all the um, uh, issues we dealt with. The results. Um, we. Um, we thought, we, we came to the conclusion that if we want to solve the problems of the world, we cannot just uh, change the way we move stuff from China to Europe and from Africa to China, etc. We have to radically rethink how we organize our economy. And uh, these arrows, they indicate that if we think uh, about a circular economy, we should start in the household. How, we, how can we reduce the waste from the household? How, uh, if we cannot do it in our household, what can we do in the neighborhood? And what we cannot do in the household or in the neighborhood, what can we do in the station biotope? 
And if we cannot do it there, then uh, we have to look for opportunities in the metropolitan landscape. But this is the order. Always try to look for the smallest scale. Um, that's why we also came up with um, a proximity label, uh, which could be uh, developed by the government. Maybe um, Marco can uh, help with this. Um, the idea is that uh, if you look at the household, you could give, uh, you could use the proximity label to indicate how much is actually processed within the household or in the neighborhood. Maybe with your, uh, with your neighbors, uh, you can um, make it a nice competition to get the green label for proximity. Uh, and it's about energy, mobility, economy, nature, water, waste, food, culture, education, care, public services. So everything. Um, this also means that we have to think how we can make the neighborhood stronger. And uh, therefore, we came up with this principle. Remove two out of three streets to create public space for playing children, for um, uh, sitting on a, on a bench for if you are a pensionado, um, for exercising, for meeting friends, for doing nothing. And another uh, idea was we cannot, we can no longer think that uh, nature is outside of our cities. Um, we have to realize that nature is everywhere and uh, ecosystems uh, don't um, make a difference between the city and the countryside. We should repair ecosystems everywhere, also in the city. And that's when we came with this proposal for Rotterdam Alexander, where you see the A20 elevated, you see a mobility hub for a circular uh, economy, and uh, a lot of walking, um, some cycling, and a station nearby. So here you can really organize everything uh, as you want. And it's also possible because uh, the neighborhoods of one square kilometer uh, don't have cars by themselves, they have hubs that, in, that connect them to the outside world. Uh, here, this is a plan for uh, Wenzhou that we made uh, in 2019-2020. Uh, uh, um, and it's for a nature-inclusive city um, where we propose a resilient e ecological system. Uh, there are big issues with web, uh, wetlands, uh, with uh, deforestation, etc. Uh, green mobility framework, harmonious mixtures, micro cities, and inclusive economic growth. Uh, here you see two areas. One is the central area, which is a high density development with a hub where the metro system and the highway system and the train system uh, meet and feed an area uh, for walking, cycling, uh, the core area of the, of the city. And in uh, orange, you see a different area, which is a normal neighborhood. Actually, everything outside of that red area is made up of these orange uh, patches, one square kilometer, um, a couple of hubs to connect them to other places, and uh, car-free, almost car-free um, in that uh, area, and the mixed-use uh, economy, so working, uh, living, uh, leisure, uh, schools, etc. Here you see the core area. And also, uh, because we, uh, we push out the car, uh, there's a lot of room to, uh, to repair the ecosystems, the wetlands. And this is the typical neighborhood. Uh, it's um, uh, redeveloped neighborhood, so uh, existing buildings are combined with new buildings, etc. Um, and everything is here, and you see the hubs around it. Um, they are only like five minutes walking max, uh, and there you can find a bicycle, a car, uh, public transport, uh, whatever you need. And that's also where all the deliveries come. So the deliveries uh, may be uh, safe from a pizza that you order, that can be brought by bicycle or by uh, someone walking to your door, but uh, the, the big delivery is not entering the neighborhood. 
Um, a Dutch example uh, that we're working on currently is the um, Alkmaar station area. And this is where we uh, really fight for this uh, slow traffic uh, networks and also the ecological networks. Um, we have this uh, station in the middle, uh, this uh, passerelle uh, crossing the tracks. Uh, there will be more trains because of high frequency uh, program for high, high frequency trains uh, to Amsterdam, which is coming to uh, Alkmaar in 2028. Um, we combine a, a new bus station with a mobility hub where you have bicycle parking, where you have underground parking for the whole area um, and mixed use development on top of it. Um, and we have a high density green city. And from this station, uh, there are all kinds of routes to the city which are car free. So this is where you see the the only road, the only proper road in the area is parallel to the tracks and it serves the bus station uh, and also the mobility hub. Uh, but on top of it and behind it, uh, there is a mixed use development. Here you see the organization with the mobility hub uh, and the bus station connected directly to the passerelle and the car free area uh, on, the, on the other side. Uh, here is the other side of the passerelle with a high density uh, development and repair of the, um, of the uh, Houtvaart um, uh, parks. Uh, high density development with green on the roofs, etc. Car free for playing, sitting, doing whatever you want. And that's uh, my story. Thank you very much, um, Tom. Um, well, perhaps there are some questions or a question mark. <coughs> yes, uh, Tom, thanks for your, uh, thanks for your uh, keynote. Um, one of the questions uh, we have uh, also from the chat is, um, it's an integral approach. Uh, you have a lot of uh, concepts uh, in development in, in Holland and Asia. Um, it's governmentally, uh, 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 yeah, uh, top down eh, because it's uh, it's the 20 uh, 2050 circular economy we want to achieve um, but what are the the challenges I mean uh, construction wise it would be possible probably um, but what are the, the challenges you think uh, in order to to get these plans uh, really uh, really in place um, what I experience is that um, people are really enthusiastic about car free cities about uh, greening uh, especially now with the corona crisis, um, everybody experienced that uh, they are missing green and uh, the direct environment where you live, where you walk the dog, uh, where your children play is extremely important. So this is a, a very uh, big uh, pro <coughs> for this uh, development. Uh, on the other hand, there are politicians that still think in the old fashioned way about uh, the number of parking spaces. Um, but you see that uh, things are shifting. I think we're in the middle of a slow revolution and um, things are happening step by step, but uh, increase increasingly fast. Mm. And I think that's very fascinating about this time that things are happening. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now uh, we have our third speaker, Arne Leibers from Meccano. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, let me see. Yes. Oh, one back. Sorry, went fast. Uh, Meccano, I think it was also uh, mentioned, uh, uh, a comment about engineers. Well, we are engineers, uh, and we engineer um, from the use of uh, buildings. Um, and we also try to do that multidisciplinary. So we try to do it in all different scales, beca because I think that's really important, or uh, even a necessity in mobility, is that you look through all those skills, how that is working. Eh? So from city planning, uh, to the design of a park or a street uh, or a lobby of a building can be a part of the uh, of this uh, uh, same uh, uh, topic. Um, we always uh, try to do that in a method not from uh, the direction of traffic, but from the the method of people, place, purpose, and also in that following. So we first want to look at people, 
uh, and uh, how they use space. So really literally looking at people who live there, who, who will be living there, uh, and how will, the, how will they use the, the space. And that can uh, go through all different types of spaces and skills. So that can be in a, in, in a city, in a park, but also in a building. Uh, it's very important to work from that uh, uh, perspective. And then the place, uh, the context, looking at the, how the context exists, uh, looking at history, but also looking at the future uh, uh, with a purpose that it will change and, and that it should be flexible and, and, and that we know that it uh, uh, should be able to facilitate all those, uh, all those uh, changes. Um, well, and then we thought that it's interesting to look first at where are we now, is that we see that uh, uh, in the city nowadays that uh, uh, more modalities are, are, are arriving. Uh, 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 we see that uh, uh, all those different pipelines that are being created for a specific uh, modality uh, is being used by different modalities, different speed. Eh? Uh, also, Corona learned us that the electric uh, uh, bike deliveries went up and up. Well, that's a thing in the city that, uh, th th that is a, a change of uh, scene. Um, that there's a loss of spatial qualities. It was already mentioned. Eh? So also this uh, um, uh, eight football fields, you said, uh, with parking places. Um, you see that also happening with the bikes. Eh? So everybody is looking in a romantic way uh, at bikes, but bikes uh, is maybe a better way to, uh, to travel, but it also um, uh, creates other uh, issues eh? because at the end, this is not a spatial quality uh, and, and also creates a different use of public space. Eh? So, so this is the, 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 the station in, uh, in Rotterdam, Central Station, uh, and in front of maybe one of the most uh, important uh, uh, public spaces in the city, it's being used as a parking place for, uh, uh, for modalities. Uh, and we see more and more that, of course, it's good to uh, make dense areas to uh, leave space for, for greenery, but it also uh, creates other issues in the in the city that we have to think about how we uh, how we want to solve it eh? and another solution mass mobility as a service uh, is a great uh, way to use mobility to see how we can share it instead of owning it eh? so so uh, to create literally space eh? because if you calculate if everybody wants uh, uh, this uh, this American dream with a big freestanding house a car with a wide fence it doesn't fit eh? I mean if everybody in the world uh, is able to uh, to have that. It doesn't fit, and then we uh, we do really uh, um, determine how uh, how the world will look like. Uh, so that's also a thing to look at uh, how we want to 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 um, um, uh, uh, design different types of spaces that can facilitate those different types of uh, use. Well, where are we going? I think tomorrow's targets is uh, capacity is a big thing. Eh? Uh, if you look in the reports, they ex expect an increase of public transport by 40 percent. Uh, sustainability, uh, uh, the experience that, that besides that it is a point of travel, that it's also a an, uh, an, an quality space and, and, and that it is an, an experience and, and, and that you can also connect it to different types of uh, uh, use. Uh, and that we look at networks. Eh? So already mentioned uh, hubs and how we can um, really uh, connect uh, better uh, the different types of modalities, but also the different types of, uh, of, of, of cities to uh, uh, create a better system. Um, well, in that sense, we do think that sharing is caring, eh? so enabling uh, this 40% of growth by f uh, 2040, it, it is a necessity to look in not owning, uh, but to see if we can share uh, uh, modalities. Uh, also, uh, we think that if you share it, uh, that can even mean an increase in, for instance, in, in, in the luxury of the product, but also the use of the, uh, the, the product. Um, that we really should look at that it is an experience, eh? so that the parking place is not, it should not only be a place where you park, uh, but should also a place where it's interesting maybe to stay, eh? so maybe we can connect different programmatic um, uh, elements, but also connect different buildings uh, to really see the multi-use of, uh, of space. Um, and see if we can really connect it in a way um, uh, to a, a seamless mobility network. Uh, uh, we do think that that mass, but also connecting in a digital way is very important to, uh, to, to let that work. Eh? It is growing. We see more and more also from the perspective of delivery. Ordering uh, food and stuff is a big part of this, uh, this problem. Um, and I think uh, very important to targeting 100% uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, to see if we can do it in a, in, in, in a way that we can also um, uh, make a better world in uh, that sense. Um, looking at projects, we do think it's, it's, it's interesting to look at it in a positive way to see if we can increase the, the, the quality and use that quality to also solve the, the problem. 
um, and uh, to really see if we, uh, from the perspective of mobility, if we can enjoy the, the romance of the, of the journey. Um, and looking at stations, first from a bigger scale, uh, we see that the station is uh, uh, changing in, in the posi position of the city. Eh? First, the, the church of the cathedral was the centerpiece of the city, and then you had neighborhoods occur uh, around them. It's a typical Dutch way of building cities, eh? so we have a lot of the, the, the cities like that. But then you see that the station just outside the, the old city core uh, was being placed and first was on the outside of the city. But by time, by the growing of the city, the, the, the station becomes the new, the, the, the modern cathedral and it really becomes the centerpiece of the city. Um, and that's also an example that I want to show where we did the, the station in Delft uh, together with the city hall. Um, uh, and uh, being a mobi mobility hub to both the old uh, part of the city as the new part. And by lowering the, the train tracks underground, uh, those two parts of the city were connected. And then the station became this kind of centerpiece in the city, uh, what became really a, an interesting uh, destination, but also a place to stay, eh, because it was combined with different types of uh, uh, program. So uh, Delft, interesting city, because it's also a, a very old city, um, but also a new city with the technical uh, university. Uh, for us, very important to see how we can connect it and also connect it in the design. So we looked in different perspectives from a, the, the, the big scale of the building, but also the small scale of the, the interior design to create a space that connects to both parts of the, of the city. Uh, so we created this uh, huge public space uh, that connected the underground uh, uh, parking uh, from the bikes to the, to, to the, to the uh, platforms of the trains to create a, a public space where people can stay and can uh, connect to the city. The, the building is all sided uh, and the plinth uh, should be this continuous space from outside to inside and really connecting all those different uh, mobilities. Also looking at the, the, the city hall, uh, in our design we uh, implement the, the, the same urban uh, uh, qualities in the office design. So we took the urban planning of an uh, old part of Delft and we uh, uh, used it for the, the urban planning of the offices, creating alleys, uh, 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 courtyards uh, to meet, but also to connect to this, uh, to this station. Um, and, and with this statement of a new identity with a, a, a modern building uh, that really connects all sides to, to different layers of the city, um, uh, and also really uh, uh, connecting this uh, mobility part of the trains to the, to the city and became this destination in, uh, in Delft. Um, in that sense, we think a building can be uh, a city connector uh, and is a big part, uh, of course, uh, in the sense if it is a mobility hub. But we also do think that uh, every building can be a part to connect uh, uh, cities, to connect people, uh, but to co connect also different types of uh, spaces. A project that we did in, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we created uh, one of the largest opera centers in the, in the world. Uh, and for us, it was very important from this perspective of people, from the use of this building, how we can redefine that space. So we created a design that uh, a part of this program was a part of the public domain. Eh? It is also like a, a lot of opera centers in the world uh, have this problem of uh, in inclusive, inclusiv inclusivity, inclusiviteit, yeah. difficult word. Um, how it can be inclusive and how it can really be a part of the public domain. So we designed a building in a tropical country where we created a space um, that was uh, open, not air conditioned, 
um, but uh, uh, was protected against the sun and uh, the wind, the sea wind, because it's an island, Taiwan, was able to flow through the building. Uh, and that space um, uh, uh, was outside and is, in, and is inside, is the foyer of the different uh, concert halls. Um, and that space was a, um, a permeable, permeable uh, area that was also connected to a park. So that's why for us it was very important that it was this kind of continuous route. And that uh, besides that there are concert hall, that it became this, uh, um, uh, this, this huge park where different uh, foyers were connected. And public and private uh, was uh, seamlessly uh, going, uh, going together uh, and also showcasing the pro program from inside. So uh, that really happened is that also in between all those different concert halls, uh, all, st all those different uses and different activities uh, were occurring in this uh, area and is really um, being used in that sense. Uh, besides that it is a huge building, uh, for us very important that it uh, connected um, very good with the uh, public area. It's a special day for Taiwan. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of China. Come a true people's palace, especially designed for all people of Taiwan. Thank you. So for us, redefining space from the perspective of use and, and the people uh, is uh, a method that we uh, try to use in all different scales. Um, and that's also what we uh, did in a study that we were doing together with the, 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 the NS, so, so the Dutch railway, Railways, uh, where we looked into this journey of the future and that mobility uh, uh, as an experience. And we tested also in the Dutch Design Week uh, different ways of uh, modalities, but also how it can influence uh, um, uh, our uh, different um, uh, city elements. So both big scale uh, city cores, uh, old city uh, cores, but also uh, hubs just out the city, uh, but also neighborhoods that are transforming because of they have a, a parking hub. And, and in that sense, uh, very important to, to look in this rights of way uh, to see who um, uh, should be f uh, how we should facilitate it for all those different uh, 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 modality streams. And for us, uh, the type of modality is important, but also um, uh, what, it, uh, uh, what it does in size. Eh? So also the, the space e efficiency is very important, if it's shared or not. So that was this uh, mobility as a service, but also if it is clean. So you could even say that this rights of way um, is also um, uh, uh, layered in different types of properties that you uh, can look into uh, if you give it the right of way to come closer to the object that it wants to uh, wants to go. So we implemented in different uh, case studies. We transformed a couple of city centers uh, that was also just uh, for the study. So for instance, this is uh, Rotterdam uh, Central, where we really looked into how the space could look like from a positive uh, uh, perspective by uh, including all those different types of uh, modalities and the diff different types of, uh, op of use. Uh, Amsterdam Sloterdijk, where we really fought this uh, just outside uh, uh, the city, where this station becomes almost this uh, uh, anchor point of the development. Eh? So towers are already arising, but the question is, is how you can conne connect this uh, existing uh, urban tissue with the, the new developments, and also that this station really can become uh, the city center of that neighborhood. Eh? So that also really can connect those different areas that says something about how you facilitate the different uh, uh, parking and, and uh, the different uh, um, uh, mass opportunities, but it also says something about the quality of the space, so that the space really should be this quality space where people can meet uh, and stay, uh, and also uh, outside the city where we already have uh, parking transferium and also a lot of companies uh, and those huge boxes are being placed. 
how we can really uh, uh, create quality um, uh, in that area to really connect also to the to the to the nature that's there, but also connect uh, to the smaller city centers. Uh, that it really can be this hub station to travel further to the to the bigger cities. Um, so in that uh, study, we really dove into those different kind of skills, skill steps to see how that can work uh, from the perspective of sharing, uh, but also from the perspective of the experience and that the space should be a, a quality uh, uh, area. And that's also how we jumped into the train, that this journey as an experience was very important in our interior design of the train because there was even a reaction in the Dutch newspaper about our design is that uh, Tony Keuken said that, yeah, a train should be a tube from A to B and the fastest as possible. And we said, yeah, that's true, that's fine, but we want to design it in a way that if you're in a tube, that it's also a quality space and that you can use it in your activities that you do through the day because you sit there an hour, one and a, one and a half hour, maybe if it delays a bit, a little bit longer. But uh, we, for us, it was very important to see if we can design it in a way that it also could be a quality space. We analyzed the train, we analyzed um, uh, how it's being used and, and, and how people are acting uh, while they're traveling uh, and really saw that uh, by research of the, of the Dutch railways that the amount of different activities is, is, is really large and quite similar to what we do at home or what we do in our office. So we thought it is very important to look at those different activities to look at different zoning eh, so that you can both sit in a train and, and, and have a chat with your friend, but also have an area where you can uh, uh, read a book or maybe rest a little bit um, and creating different modules that can facilitate those uh, activities. So those modules were a kind of catalog of different, uh, different uh, activities that we placed in, in, in uh, the train and really created the, this whole modular system uh, also circular and, and can be changed in time and also with different uh, time spans of the of the travel really becomes this uh, place where besides that you're traveling you also can do different types of activities and really becomes an interior space instead of that it's only a tube uh, uh, where you can travel and we did that for the train uh, but we also implemented in the in the metro to see if that space really can transform to a, to a place where you stay because that's also the at the end uh, the the case so we think in that sense, to wrap up, that the future of sustainable mobility uh, should be about the romance of the journey, uh, integration into surrounding urban fabric, both existing as new, um, be recognizable, re recognize, recognize, recognizable and have an identity, um, and really becomes a place for people where they come together to meet, work, learn and play. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arne. Um, well, Mark, do we have... A burning question well, from the uh, audience. Well, uh, just one uh, one thing uh, on, on question. Uh, you, you're, you're shaping a lot of uh, uh, central areas of the cities. Um, do you think it looks as if you are making space for um, urban space, uh, shipping areas? Do you think you have to demolish? Because that's the one of the things we don't want, that we need to demolish uh, part of these buildings in order to, to, to make room for, uh, for these public um, areas. No, I don't think so. No, I, I also think that uh, that's also something we see in practice is that uh, more and more uh, transformation will occur. Eh? So uh, in past, we already built quite a lot, uh, but I do think it's possible uh, to do this also by transforming buildings, but also really look into public space. So redefine space to see what you want to create. Eh? So also you saw that in the, in the, the presentations uh, before me is that looking in how you want to use it uh, is very important in, in how it looks. And, and now uh, m more often it's a result of elements while we, it, it would be better if we think what we really want. Okay, do you have another question? I have one, uh, I have yeah. one more question. Um, uh, will these public spaces you, uh, you design overtake the functions of, of current parks, like uh, the Vondel Park in Amsterdam or whatever? Uh, and what if people then do picnics or birthday parties at these station areas? What about that? Would that be suitable for that? Just let it happen? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think every place has a should have a kind of ground rules how you use it, but I think also society will solve that. So I, I, to be honest, I, I don't think that is an issue in planning how you make it, uh, uh, but I do think that design can help that. Eh? So design can uh, create areas that you more or less yeah, realize what you, what you can do, and of course that still can go wrong, but I do think that design can really help to, to divine and, 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 and see the opportunity of use. But I also really think it's important 
to keep that free eh, so that there, 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 there will be space that people can uh, participate and, and, and cr create placemaking and really own the space instead of that we really define everything. So I think that should always be a part of the design, that there's always a, 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 a part that will surprise you and really gives you the, the opportunity to, to make it your own and, and, and really uh, to, to create a place in that sense. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I have, uh, I have a question uh, myself. Uh, Ton uh, uh, talked about um, uh, things are changing rapidly, uh, fast, uh, but Marco, is it fast enough? Oh, that's a, that's a tough <laughs> tough one. Well, I, but what I'm observing here is that what I try to bring forward is this apparent difficulty of challenging our rationality. Because what I see here, and that's I think the change that will happen, is that this will happen at a certain point, and then the three of us will pr probably become obsolete. Because <coughs> what I've seen here are beautiful projects that but still apply the same rationality. Uh, that created the problems that are presented in the so it's it's quite ironic that we present a list of problems that are created largely through our ways of dealing with how we organize society and cities they, they created all of these problems and now we are using the same rationality to solve it so I think this way of working although I really applaud all these plans are more or less um, cleaning up uh, the problems that we created in the first place but it will not lead us to, I do, I do not, I see very little um, new rationality. I still see a lot of uh, 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 seeing the city as a puzzle uh, that we can engineer, that we can optimize. I heard networks, I heard pizzas that have to be delivered to our house as fast as possible. It's still sort of this machine that needs to work properly. And I think that rationality, uh, and that's already Illich, uh, Meadows, all the thinkers of the 70s pointed it out. We are 50 years later and we are still doing the same thing. We're still not embracing a complete different understanding of how to organize uh, cities. We still think that we can from, uh, like Le Corbusier, from the, from, from the top down, from bird's eye perspective, create, um, create better worlds. And I think that's the rationality that we really need to question if we want to make big changes happen. Well, Tom, what do you have to say on that? Well, I absolutely don't agree, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. <coughs> yeah. No, I think uh, what is uh, what I think uh, what I recognize in Marco's story is the essence of the street as uh, in between space, which is not defined, where everything can happen, uh, which is owned by the people who uh, live around it, and even the birds and the insects that live there. And uh, I think what is uh, what is crucial is to uh, make a distinction between these uh, neighborhoods uh, where everything can happen, <coughs> which can function almost like a, a, like a medieval city or like a village uh, without cars, um, basically self-sufficient if they want, uh, if, if you have the right uh, stimulus uh, from other uh, uh, directions then uh, those neighborhoods can produce their own energy, they can harvest their own rainwater, they can uh, grow their own food, they can uh, 3D print whatever they need. Uh, so th in my opinion, there is absolutely no limit uh, to the potential of the neighborhood. And that would create a totally different uh, reversal of globalization and also uh, a huge uh, perspective for uh, biodiversity, uh, regeneration, etc., etc. Then, uh, having said that, uh, there will always be networks. Also in the medieval times, we had networks, we had gates, we had uh, places where the local was connected to the global or <coughs> to the national or, no, well, we didn't have nation states then, but um, uh, this, this idea of uh, creating an area which is local and is connected through gates with uh, other places, I think this is uh, rather crucial and this is what uh, I try to re-engineer. I'm very much uh, in favor of re-engineering um, and uh, I think if we have the right stimulus and the proximity label could be such as, uh, uh, an incentive but uh, there are many more incentives that, that you could think of. 
uh, then I, I, I really see that this neighborhood um, can become a vital part in a sustainable society. Aina, um, Marco said you are doing the same as 50 years before. Um, yeah, I, I don't really <laughs> think so, but I, I understand what he's saying. I, I also do think that this radical change of, of, of the way how we think about stuff is important to to, to really do something different. Eh? So, so <coughs> I, yeah, that's also the example that I gave, for instance, the bike edit. Everybody sees the bike as the the the, the solution, but I, I, I think it's, it's also a problem on its, uh, on its own. Um, yeah, we, we try to do that in a way of to, to think about the, the, the way of use, eh? but then yeah, the risk is, of course, that you only look into the way of use that is occurring now, eh? so that, that it will create almost the same uh, uh, problems. Uh, but I really do believe also that you do it in a, in a way uh, with, the, with the neighborhood. Eh? So that was also uh, the question was being asked, what is one of the challenges in those uh, developments is also uh, doing it, uh, 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 participating with um, uh, uh, the, 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 the people who are going to live, work, or uh, um, uh, recreate in that area. Eh? So also be, let them be a part of the problem and see if they really um, uh, 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 do want it in a way as it is designed. So I, I, I believe that that can help um, uh, uh, if that is um, lead it well uh, to, to, to see how you can uh, really create a, a, a city or a part of the city that is owned by the, by the people. And then I think the, the, the decisions is quite easy if you look at the, um, uh, uh, the choices that you have. Okay. Um, Mark, do you have a question? I have, yes, I have uh, one more uh, one more question. It's an interesting uh, question from a viewer, and it, it more hits the topic of circularity, uh, as, as seeing as, as buildings and, and even cities as, as material banks. Uh, didn't really uh, discuss this uh, now, um, but uh, it's uh, Michael Keis asking um, if the new buildings are made in a circular way. Um, um, can we then repurpose them sooner so that we do not have them in the same form and functions over over 50 years? So, can we create a really adaptive city uh, because we can uh, uh, we, we can dismantle and and rebuild? What do you think about that? Is that something that you are really thinking about now, uh, not on, on the urban scale, but maybe on a on a, on a building level scale? Yeah, I think I, I think uh, this is. Um, uh, uh, I think you have to think about the context uh, about uh, circularity. Circularity is uh, very important. It's necessary that we uh, harvest materials from our building stock and um, uh, try to reuse them. Um, and actually, um, it can be done quite successful, but sometimes the materials are in Tilburg and not in Amsterdam, so you have to use transportation, which raises the question, uh, how do you organize the transportation in a sustainable way? Uh, so it's again about uh, urban mobility and uh, national mobility. Uh, could also be global mobility. Sometimes uh, you can use, for example, aluminium from Sweden, which is produced with 100% uh, sustainable electricity. Uh, and um, so that's, that's a, but that if you make it in the Netherlands, you need gas to uh, to melt it, uh, etc. So, um, I think also when you think about reusing buildings, some uh, s s uh, <coughs> the human culture is also a dynamic thing. So people are moving to cities, then they are moving out of cities. If the sea level rises. Uh, too far, uh, we have to move to the east to to look for higher grounds, uh, which means that um, even though you use all your thinking power, maybe of uh, of your peers and your engineers, and you try to make an adaptive building, which is 100% ad adaptable, uh, in 50 years' time, situation has changed. There is no market; uh, it will be demolished, or people don't like the building. Uh, so then uh, what is very important is that you can take them apart and harvest the materials for something else. Yeah. But it doesn't uh, mean that you shouldn't try to yeah. make 100% uh, adaptable uh, city tissue. It can, be, it can be 
be a goal, but would not necessarily be a goal on its own to adapt the city in, a, in another way uh, just next door, but just designed for disassembly we know, would be a goal. We know that uh, uh, today more than 50% of the world population lives in cities and in uh, in 50 years time it will be like uh, 80 percent yeah. so uh, this means that if you're on the wrong location it doesn't matter whether your building is adaptable it will be empty yeah. and uh, it doesn't matter whether you have an adaptable building there will be a building next door uh, because people are moving there yeah. so this is the kind of uh, things that we also have to take into account yeah okay thank you okay um well, if there are no further questions, and uh, I want to uh, thank the speakers. Can I ask you? A yeah. Question? So, so why, why? Because I'm looking at the at the at the, the visual language here as well. And why did you choose to have this this bird eye perspective of a city as the background image to talk about urban mobility? Because I think that's one of the problems here is that we are talking about people, but we are simplifying them. There's no sociologist here. There's no social scientist involved. We talk about engineers and designers. Um, wouldn't it help if we force ourselves to stop looking at the city from this production forest view and use images that put people really central? Would that not also invite other people to the table that are currently not uh, considered? Like what happened at the, at the, at the schoolyard, is that people were not they didn't feel felt invited because they thought that the street was something for, of traffic engineers. As soon as we started to change the conversation and said it was about the living environment of children, you get completely new voices to the table. And that's what we need if we really want change. So I would, I would challenge you to rethink also uh, even the visual language that we use to, to, talk, to talk about this uh, topic. So I don't know if that was an uh, uh, explicit choice to use this image or not, but... Uh, it's well, just an example for me. It's a pornographic image of one of my designs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, it's actually... It's uh, a production forest. It's a, tra <laughs> it's a transit oriented development project, a project where you have uh, two metro stations. Machine. And um, now it's not a machine. It's a, it's a place for encounter, like in the medieval cities, uh, the, um, the central uh, square. But uh, this is where you can, uh, can go. And uh, the current situation mm -hmm. in Chinese cities is you have these uh, large boulevards with cars. And we try to move from the car use to the public transport. So that's, uh, that's what you see here. But what I think uh, you are fighting against this kind of imagery, against engineering. I think actually uh, from my practice what I know is that you get the best results if we collaborate because what you, what you want is the same as what I want but um, we have different uh, discussions to, um, uh, we, we have different, different discussions for example with uh, investors, with uh, engineers, um, we have lots of, we try to bring together all these different influences from different sites, including ecologists, etc. Um, bring it together and uh, communicate with drawings. And uh, always, uh, for example, for this cradle-to-cradle uh, 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 -cradle cafe, uh, you have to choose one picture. So uh, I didn't choose this, but we also have pictures where people are center stage. But what is important is that you do your thing, you bring in the people, and I bring in the knowledge about how the city works, and then we can do fantastic things. I think that's really what is needed, top down, bottom up, everything together with uh, Urgenda uh, fighting battles in court, uh, with uh, the Volvo producing 90% uh, CO2 free but, but steel. It doesn't bother you that after the last 50 years we haven't uh, moved an inch in the, into the right direction with this logic? Uh, doesn't bother you. Uh, like in the 70s, no, we had the same I, discussion. I, no, 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 no. I, 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 I am from the 70s. <laughs> I'm from the 50s, actually. Uh, I know we moved a lot. There is this such a huge difference now and the 70s. You cannot compare that. There is, uh, we made so much progress, but you don't see it because we are in the middle of a revolution. And in the next five years, you will see amazing things. Everything is shifting. Everything is shifting. Big investors worldwide are looking for, uh, for your knowledge, for, for my knowledge, 
to see for uh, for for Meccano's knowledge, to see how you can bring this uh, all these demands into a new uh, <coughs> culture of uh, urban planning. So I'm I'm really very positive, but I'm also um, very motivated because this is so necessary. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thank you, Marco, for uh, let us uh, look different to the to the images uh, we use. Um, um, I think that's a, that's a nice um, uh, idea. Um, well, I think if nobody has, uh, there are no questions, I think and we're going to end uh, the Cradle to Cradle Cafe now. Um, thank you again for your uh, presentations and for the discussion afterwards. Um, for the next uh, three uh, Cradle to Cradle uh, Cafes, we will combine the webcast with a live uh, audience. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, for, for, tho for those who are watching uh, from abroad, please join us, uh, the next uh, Cradle to Cradle Cafés. Um, the upcoming cafés uh, where you can uh, physically attend are uh, in September, Sustainability in the Heart of Europe, in Gare Maritime in Brussels. Um, in October 19, Cradle to Cradle and Hospitality, in Domesdela, uh, Eindhoven. And November 22, we have the Cradle to Cradle Café uh, and Health and Wellbeing in the Tepijn Caserne in Maastricht. Um, if you want to join uh, the cafés as, uh, as an audience, uh, please um, send uh, uh, an, an email or uh, yeah, give a sign to, uh, to us. And you can also check uh, www.cradletocradlecafé.com um, for more information. On behalf of uh, Arendt, Moza, Kubik and Tarket, uh, thank you for watching. Um, and um, as of the day of tomorrow, you can uh, watch uh, this cafe back on our YouTube channel. So, um, well, uh, we hope you enjoyed it and uh, we hope to see you at one of the upcoming cafes. Thank you. <laughs>